Hi, I'm Michelle Fenton, and welcome to the Happy Texture Podcast. What would it take to develop resilient, sustainable communities? How do we design cities that support our collective happiness? Join me as my guests and I discuss how we can plan, implement, and foster places that allow us to flourish and grow. Okay, hey, welcome to the first episode of Happy Texture, the Happy Texture podcast. Um, I am delighted to be with my first guest, Danielle Wiley, Senior uh, Public Space Planner at the City of Vancouver. Danielle, welcome. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to be here. Um, well, we go back a long ways, and so this is why it's such a special treat for me to have you kick off this um, podcast. Um, and we're really here to talk about public space, you being the Senior Planner at the City of Vancouver. The city is... Uh, doing quite a tremendous amount of work and putting quite a bit of effort and resources into making our public space uh, more beautiful, more uh, accessible to all. So it, it's great to have you here to talk about this topical issue right now. And uh, maybe we should just start with um, why, well, let's start with your role at the city mm-hmm. and what you do, what your t- you and your team do, and uh, how that helps fulfill what the city's mandate on uh, public spaces. Sure. So I'm part of a relatively new group at the city in the public space and street use division. And so I, as a senior public space planner, was brought on to form a team that oversees, on the one hand, our plaza and public space stewardship. So that's taking care, managing, operating and programming public spaces on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, looking at our Viva program, which is activating public space. So that's really our tactical urbanism group where we get the public involved and community organizations involved in doing events and activations in public space to um, amplify public life Mm. and participation. Well, certainly it's become a little bit more, I'm not sure how long your team has been operating, but certainly the activation part has been uh, a lot more visible. Um, in the city recently, certainly from my perspective. Um, and there, there must have been quite an uptake on it for it to, to start. It seems to be building momentum in the city. So It absolutely is, and it reflects a very deliberate investment on mm-hmm. our part in supporting the program and, and forming a team around it. Great. Um, well, I, I, I hope you don't mind. That. I'd love to get a little switch gears a little bit to the personal journey. Uh, I mean, you're quite passionate about your... Um, your involvement in this program and I know you've recently started this this um, with this group at the city and so your journey has, has in in a very seemingly constructed way even. <laughs> I don't know, led, you, led you to it it seemed like there was um, there's a momentum there there's a purpose there that's always been there do you mind talking about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, this is a funny question for us because, of course, we, we had a long history. Yeah. We met in architecture school, I oh want to say, 25 years ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so my background is in architecture, and and I practiced in architecture for, for several years. Yeah. And my interest started to drift from buildings and details and construction. Well, you even did your PhD on public space, exactly. right? So there's always been that yearning, that purpose that you Exactly, had. because it started to switch from the building to the bigger picture. Right. And so I started to become more interested in public space and urban planning. And so I switched gears out of practicing architecture into doing my PhD. And that was partly driven um, that through my education, I, I lived in Italy for a while. I lived in Rome for a few years. And there I was working on classes and some of our projects, but I was also just in the Eternal City looking at their incredible yes. public realm. And that started to be really interesting to me. So when I went into my uh, PhD, I started to look at neighborhoods and specifically the public space armature in different master plan neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. And the, master, the case studies I looked at were been neighborhoods around Falls Creek. In oh. Vancouver. Oh, that's and that, <laughs> exactly. And so that ended up what springboarded me into coming to work for the city of Vancouver. And and let's just like go back and, and let our, our audience know that you you didn't you're not from Vancouver. No, yeah. no, I'm from a very small town yeah. in Ontario that 
does not have <laughs> the kinds of public spaces that you have in a city sure. and where you just don't have the need for it. Yeah. Um, it's just such a different, it's such a different world. But going through architecture and having experience of living in cities really fed my passion for urban life and the way that outdoor space is used by a community. Yeah, so coming to the city of Vancouver, I did spend my time uh, for the first eight years in the planning department, uh, which makes a lot of sense with an architecture background, yeah. uh, looking at developments. But my interest in working with private development was always that interface with the public realm. So how can the building can be generous and gracious to the public realm mm -hmm. and, and frame the public space that that the city, you know, that, that yeah. frames the city life. Yeah. Uh, that's what I always saw as my role as a civil servant is thinking about the public benefit. Mm -hmm. And and so it was, a, for me, a really natural then move over to the engineering department of the public space um, because that just has kind of narrowed my focus on, on the public realm. Wonderful. Well, it, it, I, when I say constructed, I mean perhaps it was a pull towards towards where you are right now because the, the journey doesn't seem to even though you've had a few uh, changes of course a little bit here and there, the journey seems to have a very direct purpose is what I really <laughs> meant to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let's, let's take a step back and look at why does the city think uh, public space matters? That's a big question. It is. Right? Why does public space matters? Well, our team is super passionate about this issue and it's something that we think about a lot. And public space for us is really multifaceted. It is uh, the living room and the backyard of the public. It is the site of public life. It's where different groups of people will come together uh, deliberately and sometimes accidentally. Yep. And, <laughs> and that's what makes it really exciting. Yep. And it has a traditional uh, purpose as being really fundamental to democracy in that there, there are spaces where we can have peaceful expression, uh, political demonstrations, um, public expression. Uh, it's related to our charter rights and freedoms. Mm -hmm. And it's places where different groups can come and express their culture, express, express their political beliefs, and express themselves. At the same time, it also fulfills a really important function just for social gatherings. So whether it's small or large groups, it's just a place where you meet your friend. It's a place where um, you might join in larger gatherings, where we have concerts, where we have public events, uh, free public programming, as these are meant to be uh, accessible to all, mm -hmm. uh, which is a really important part of just having a lively public life. And it's particularly important in the city. Yeah. where we don't have the large backyards where we might be gathering and casually in those ways. So this is really where people are concentrated together, are able to share space outside together. Mm -hmm. It's also a really important um, place for our marginalized communities. And this is also where we see people uh, engaging in subsistence spending, uh, where if, if you don't have a home or if you don't have a uh, right. way of supporting yourself, yeah. often you're spending a lot more of your day in public space. Mm -hmm. And it might be, and it is part of, an, uh, of a different level of the economy uh, where there are vending activities um, that, that people are surviving on. And so it's something for us to be really mindful of mm -hmm. is that public space is available to all groups. And we have to find ways to navigate the different needs yeah. and uses of public space for all of these different groups. Absolutely. And that's where the, the task of developing public space that's for all in the public good quotations uh, becomes really nuanced because you oftentimes in the space like that, you'd have conflicting requirements or conflicting ideas of how a public space should be used. For sure. And I actually think that public space is important to that purpose and that mm -hmm. does serve democracy is that to a degree, you do want the conflict in right. that we don't want <laughs> we don't want riots, but we do want friction. And yeah. public space is a really important space where we get to rub against people who are different from us. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes that can be uncomfortable. Sometimes it can be inspiring. Uh, sometimes it can be challenging. And I think that's a really healthy, important uh, function mm -hmm. in, in a society. Well, certainly you see, um, you know, when, when the city becomes more dense, more diverse, the requirement for having space that is safe, culturally safe, and also from a personal, um, you know, safety point of view becomes a lot more important because the the ideals of one group of uh, cultural group 
may not necessarily play out as comfortably with another social group mm -hmm. and and the scale of those public spaces and how they're programmed or not programmed becomes a really critical issue in how they're designed. For sure. And that's why I think it's very important to have an ecology of public spaces in that no single public space is going to be is going to be able to accommodate all uses and mm -hmm. all groups within the community. But ideally every person in the community can find a public space where they can go and be right. and be comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so that we're not asking too much of one space. You need the large spaces uh, that are regionally centered that everyone can gather in, but you also need the smaller local neighborhood spaces where a smaller community might have more of a sense of ownership mm -hmm. and, and expression. Well, we, we touch a little bit on some of the uh, direct incentives that the city is uh, partaking in and that's starting to implement. Can you expand a little bit on that? Let's, let's hear sure. a little bit about it. There are a couple of really important initiatives that I'd love to touch on, and one is called um, Places for People, uh, the Downtown Public Space Strategy, mm. that is currently um, in process and is, is going to be completed this year. <laughs> That's our target. And that it's a is a big task. It is a big task. Mm. That is looking at the whole public space network. Um, a large vision of it for the downtown peninsula over the next 30 years. So it is a, a bird's eye high level strategy for how do we deliver a complete public space network in the mm. downtown. And in the context of we have a growing population and so we have this densifying downtown where our public spaces are more and more at a premium and we have a limited ways of being on a peninsula yeah. uh, get, of building more spaces. Um, and at the same time, they need to serve more and more functions than ever before. Mm -hmm. uh, as we are having a densifying city and people are living in smaller places, um, more of our life is taking place in these public spaces mm -hmm. and uh, we have more, more need of them. Uh, so that's a really important um, strategy. And some of the directions that are coming out of that are that public or principles, I should say, are that public space should be for all and by all. And that what that basically means is that everyone has to be welcome in public space, but also the by all component is that we want people to participate in the planning, design, creation, and also stewardship of public spaces so that different community groups have a, more of a sense of ownership mm -hmm. over their use and, and over the events that are taking place in them. So that's, that's one important direction. Uh, another important direction is looking at different public spaces fulfilling different functions. So we call it the right supply, mm -hmm. meaning that in a complete healthy public space network, you want spaces that are uh, contemplative and restful. You want spaces that are more active for social gathering, for commercial activity. You want spaces that are large for events and celebration and for civic expression. Uh, you want spaces that are for play. Mm -hmm. And play does not just mean for playgrounds for children. We want to be thinking of play as something that is for everyone, where there might be sort of whimsical features that are incorporated into our sidewalk spaces, mm -hmm. or into our parks and plazas, so that people of all ages can have a bit of whimsy and yeah. activity and surprise in the mm -hmm. home, and that being something that helps fuel public life as well. Well, I mean, uh, just the visual of that, when you, when you actually take a little bit of a pause and think about public space that can accommodate happenstance mm -hmm. you know I, I mean we're we're getting into a really almost an ephemeral realm of design of public space that there, there needs to be a deliberate construct but at the same time there's a looseness to it that this the happenstance can actually unfold and those everyday rituals become richer and more um, for it exactly yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's brilliant um, so in in terms of I mean we I was just looking at the a uh, UN happiness uh, report that came out. Uh, Canada's ranked ninth, which is continues to be. I think when when you think about Canadian public space, it's not it's not something we're known for. I mean, the Europeans have always been a little bit of ahead of the game, quite a bit ahead of the game when it comes to not just designing public space but embracing public space as part of their cultural identity. And so, in in terms of the indicators for a healthy public space, which uh, it might be a little bit of a stretch to say healthy, happy public space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what, what do you see are some of the key indicators of what is the city tracking? Uh, if I had to think about some indicators or features of a healthy public space, I think the first one is that a given public space 
we have to have a clearly defined idea of what its role is within that complete public space network. Meaning, is it one of the spaces that's meant to be more active, uh, meant to be more social in a space for gathering, or is it meant to be uh, more of a local, restful, quiet, contemplative space? And so once you have its role defined within the network, then that will give you ideas of how it should be programmed, how it should be designed, how it should be stewarded, and how it should be supported. So I think that's really, really important, is to understand that different spaces perform differently, and that's and that's a positive thing. Mm-hmm. Another a really important uh, indicator is how inclusive of the space. And inclusive to me means, um, first of all, that it can accommodate multiple groups. We were mm-hmm. talking a little bit earlier about the friction between different yep. groups. We want to be able to accommodate that. So a healthy public space, I think, can accommodate different users coming in for different reasons uh, and different sorts of programming. So it has a certain flexibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, inclusive to me also means um, that it is welcoming to different kinds of groups. And in some cases, that actually means that there needs to be a group that's involved either in the stewardship or even in the design so that they have a sense of um, investment and representation. Mm-hmm. Like I'm thinking of an example of, in, of including our First Nations communities. Right. There need to be some spaces in the city that are really theirs, um, that are spaces where they can express their culture and where they can participate in their culture, potentially share it with other community groups or, or potentially just... Um, not, not that they would never have exclusive use, but that it might be more focused That's right. on, on their cultural histories and on, and on their current on their, their current culture. Uh, so I think that's an important part of inclusivity as well, mm-hmm. is having moments in our public space network where different communities can really have ownership and, exp- and self-representation. Well, I mean, to go back to the, the thought that, you know, if, if when... when On the surface, when you hear something like that, you think, well, this is an exclusive space. But if you think about the network of public space and the idea that a a space that's designed for a specific group but can be shared by all is also a demonstration of the strength and vitality of that particular cultural group. For sure. So it's also a space where uh, the public can be educated Mm -hmm. as to how this group functions, what's important to them you know, what's being, what's current in their cultural sphere and their experience. Exactly. And somewhat related to this, I think a final feature is that a public space needs to be welcoming and in order to be welcoming, it needs to be safe. That's right. Exactly. And so that safety doesn't just necessarily mean, um, for example, brightly lit. Right. Because that can make some people in the community feel quite unsafe or yeah. under a spotlight. Yeah. Um, traditionally, a really. Exactly. <laughs> traditionally, publics, our public spaces have tended to attract um, a fairly narrow demographic of the population, kind of the 20 to 45-year-old range mm-hmm. of able-bodied people. Mm-hmm. And so we need to start expanding that to have our spaces feel welcoming and safe for families with small children, uh, for seniors, for women and uh, for persons with disabilities. And so we need to think about really focusing on those different groups' needs and perceptions of space from the very uh, beginning of design all the way through programming and operations. Mm -hmm. So really we're talking about a strategic, actionable plan as opposed to what are we going to do with this leftover space? (laughs) You know, I mean, let's be fair. The the public space in Canada has, has... except for perhaps in the 50s and 60s when large plazas were planned with no program whatsoever and no edges, you know, it is pretty much left as here we have some space, let's just plant some things or, you know, (laughs) some benches. So you're talking about a really intensive design exercise from beginning to end. For sure. And we have engagement components. Mm -hmm. Public engagement is very important in that if you do public engagement early, you also have an opportunity to identify groups within the community that might be interested in taking this space on and really beginning to really begin to be engaged in owning it over the long term. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I use owning in quotation marks because, of course, it is open to all stewardship. But a, a stewardship, yeah. exactly, yeah. A, a sense of belonging and involvement mm-hmm. in the space. And so public engagement is also so important for matching the design of the space to the community that is there to receive it. Mm-hmm. Well, that that gets me back to the idea of the Viva program, mm-hmm. um, because that is specifically um, targeted for for this interaction, this, this stakeholder engagement 
in a very short frame. So can we expand a little bit on, on the initiatives and the actual process for the VIVA program? Yes, as I mentioned, our VIVA pro program is our tactical urbanism group. So what and does that mean? So what that means, exactly. <laughs> what that means is that it, this is where we have an opportunity to incubate and innovate new ideas for public space. And so what that can look like is perhaps we come across an opportunity for a new public space where transportation is going to be reallocating some road space um, or changing some traffic routes where we can take over, say, a block to become a plaza, mm -hmm. uh, to, convert from, to convert it from pavement to plaza, as we call it. So rather than imposing a design from above, what we'll often do in a situation like that is that we'll work with the Viva team to test out early ideas for what that space could be and to use that on-the-ground testing as a public engagement process. So we'll get out there, set up some temporary features, tables, chairs, umbrellas, um, platforms, you know, potentially some temporary stages, piano, for example, uh -huh. and start to invite people into the space and see how they respond to that uh -huh. configuration and give them opportunities to say, yes, they want this, no, they don't want that, uh, work with local businesses, is this plaza going to support their business or are there ways that we can help it to do so? We can see who's coming into the plaza and maybe who isn't. So how can we adjust the design right. to um, relate to different community groups who might be not access, not typically accessing your public spaces? And we can have an iterative process where perhaps the following summer we do a second version of it mm -hmm. and start to refine the design so that by the time you get to a final design, uh, you've built a community around the space, but you've also really tested the design parameters so that the space is going to be as successful as possible. Yeah. That's one, one thing that Viva does. Mm -hmm. Another uh, innovative program that Viva does is that it runs activations, often through design competitions. So we will post a design competition online and disseminate it through our, through our networks that invite community groups and individuals from the public to uh, engage in a design project. That might be, for example, this year we did our Life Between Umbrellas design competition. Right. Yeah. So we were inviting people to think about activations that can happen in the rainy season. Because mm -hmm. as you know, during the winter, <laughs> it rains a lot and people are not in public space. Yeah. So what events can we do that will draw people out? Mm -hmm. um, what temporary installations can we do that will bring people out, whether they be shelters or lighting installations that would make spaces more friendly for people during the rainy season? Mm -hmm. And so the, the benefit of a competition like that is it gets people's impact for what they want to do in public space gets people's input. Um, and it also gets a conversation started mm -hmm. around public space. And in this yeah. case in the winter. Yeah. And so that's a way of really involving people and bringing out their ideas. We'll often host um, parties and public events to showcase the, the winning entries or see sometimes even just all the entries. Mm -hmm. So people uh, get to see the depth and breadth of ideas coming out of, coming out of our community and finally we will select winning entrance and we will do some of those activations so we'll fund a community group mm -hmm. to do the activation and that is building capacity in communities so that they can do things in the future uh, we'll also be funding a design build so that uh, one community group who wins this category of the competition will we'll actually work with them to build their installation in the temporary plaza and again that's investing in the community so that it's not just us who are making public space. It's mm -hmm. really coming from the grassroots. Up. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you, when you, let, let's maybe put some examples out there because some people might have a bit of a disconnect between the actual program and some of the spaces that they probably interact with every day. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the results of the Viva program? Oh, so some of the, some of the activations that we've supported have been uh, the public disco series right. that, are, that are taking place in a variety of spaces yeah. around Vancouver over the summer, whether, you know, whether one's in an alley called Alley Oop, uh, one was under the Canby Bridge, yeah. an example of a rain-friendly space. Mm -hmm. uh, another really successful, another really successful uh, program that Viva has fun funded is in Chinatown in Memorial Plaza, where... Uh, it's just a matter of supporting ping pong tables and mahjong tables, yeah. and that's you know that yeah. really relates to that community. Yeah, and that is supporting um, a, the Chinatown Youth Collective. Right. So again, we're supporting groups that are within the communities 
um, to define what programming works for their yeah. public spaces. Yeah. I mean, again, we go back to the idea that the public space often, well, in the past, is sort of a bird's eye view, uh, top down imposition. And we're talking about a totally different approach to public space. You know, when we talk about public space from the grassroots, we're also talking about scale, mm -hmm. right? Human scale. And, um, and how important it is to actually start to reflect the human scale back into public spaces to make them more activated, more friendly, more comfortable. Exactly. And it, Viva isn't always just about the parties either. And yeah. another <laughs> program that we fund that I think is really important is called Good Night Out. And what that is, is that it's a stewardship program for the Granville Street Night Nightlife District, mm -hmm. where volunteers or people, you know, earning just an honorarium go out between midnight and 2 a.m. And they are the stewards for the nightlife, basically making sure that people who perhaps are intoxicated make their way to a bus or a cab, <laughs> um, de-escalating potential conflicts, yeah. offering water, yeah. um, and, and kind of the subtext of this is also that it supports uh, anti-sexual harassment mm -hmm. um, initiatives. Yeah. So it's supporting women and, and other potentially more vulnerable people who are participating in nightlife yeah. to make sure that they're safe and that it's a good night out for yeah. everyone. So. Yeah, which hits squarely on the third uh, aspect of good public space you mentioned is public safety. And Welcoming and safe. safe. Yeah, and making that, um, that safety as broad as possible for as many different sectors in society, many different aspects of enjoying the public life possible. Mm -hmm. Well, the, I, you know, I, I didn't realize that the Granville Street Initiative was was part of the Viva Mandate. That's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. You guys should actually advertise that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we talked quite a bit about what makes good public space. So how is, how are we measuring this? Are we, what tools are we going to use to start measuring this and quantify it? That is such an interesting question, and it's something that our group is really grappling with in, in these past few years, I would say, in that traditionally we would use quite empirical tools to measure how we're doing public space. For example, each year, how many square feet or square meters of public space are we adding to the public space network? And that's important because we do need to, we do need to make sure that we're keeping a certain... We want to target having a certain amount per resident. Another way that we would measure public space is uh, pedestrian counts. How many people are coming mm. through a plaza in peak season and low season and daytime and nighttime? If it's plumbing it at night, perhaps there's some lighting issues. Yes. <laughs> if it's plummeting in the winter, you know, maybe we do need to look at some right. off-season programming. So that has been helpful. But a new strategy that we've been taking in the past couple of years is looking at happiness metrics. Mm -hmm and working with an organization called Happy City to help us measure more qualitative experiences of public space that include, uh, and, and, and these are generally done through intercept surveys. So mm -hmm. we speak to people in plazas uh, that might be passing through or might be sitting and staying and asking them, for example, in this plaza, if you drop your wallet, how likely do you think it would be that someone would return it to you? Mm -hmm. uh, if you saw a piece of litter, how likely would you be to put it in a litter can yourself? Interesting. Exactly. Yeah. If, would you come back here and meet a friend again? Mm -hmm. How often do you use this plaza? So really starting to look at people's experience, uh, their sense of ownership over it, their sense of safety, um, yeah, and their sense of enjoyment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're finding that, that research to be really useful in terms of understanding the work that we do and where we're going where we're going right and where we might need mm -hmm. course correction. And what's really inspiring is that we're finding as we're is that we're finding as we're moving this research, you know, up the chain, is that the senior management really has a lot of buy-in and sees the value right. in measuring public space this way. Yeah. That isn't just about square feet yeah. and, and data stats. and data, yeah. but really looking at measurable, quantifiable but still qualitative mm -hmm. aspects of public space. Well, that's an interesting um, aspect of measuring because uh, the idea of ha measuring happiness and the factors that are associated with that are becoming a, a really interesting and more popular way of not just measuring things in public space, but work-life balance about, you know, because socioeconomic issues, mm -hmm. um, those factors are starting to, those non-quantifiable uh, factors are starting to become really important measures 
for all aspects of social love. So it makes sense that it would be one of the top criteria in measuring Absolutely. open space. And if I would just add, I would say happiness can be a hard question to ask. Absolutely. Because it tends to be a fleeting experience. Mm-hmm. So when we're designing these questions with, with our when Happy City, our, our partner, is often the focus is on well-being. Because well-being is a more of a constant state, uh, whereas happiness, you could be asking the person about the mood. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. They walked in yeah. and out of the space. Yeah. Um, Thanks for that clarification. <laughs> for yes. sure. Uh, and so I, I find that a useful frame. Mm-hmm. And what can help us measure it is that often we'll take a, a similar block that doesn't have a plaza in it, that's you know one street over, versus the block that's been converted to a plaza, and we'll ask people about their experiences in both of those spaces right. in terms, again, of their sense of well-being. Do you feel safe? Do you feel, again, um, that you would want to come here? Would you meet a friend here? Uh, would you come again? Uh, would you... Right. Yeah. Are you comfortable? Are you comfortable? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Do you feel uh, nurtured by your environment? Exactly. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean, and I and love- we have found that for our classes, the metrics are very good. Yeah. We have found that there's a big difference between the control site and the. Mm-hmm. In the plaza. Well, I'd love to have you back just to talk about that alone <laughs> because that's a huge topic and we could probably spend quite a bit of time talking about that. Um, well, let's like maybe switch gears a little bit and um, talk about how citizens can actually engage in, in, in the programs that you have. Where do they find this information? How, how can they connect with the city to have their voices heard. Absolutely. So first off, I would say the most basic way is to go to our web page. We do have a public space landing page on the City of Vancouver website that connects to all of our programs, uh, whether the programs be a street horticulture and, and beautification, or whether it be some of the public space um, activation programs that I was talking about through Viva, the design competitions. Uh, as well as just information about our plazas and events that, that might be happening there. So I'd really encourage people to check that out. Great. What's the, what's, let's, let's do a plug for the website. It's uh, vancouver.ca. Vancouver.ca. And then if you look, if you put in the search bar public space, you'll get right. our landing page. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm going to check it out as soon as we're wrapped up here. <laughs> Thank you. And other ways to engage please absolutely participate in our public space engagements. Like for example, for the Places for People public space strategy that we're doing, we've had two years of public engagements where we've done observational public life studies, but also a lot of open houses in public spaces to try to get people's feedback about the strategy. And so please participate in those. Um, Other ways to participate are to access us through the Viva program where you as a resident or as a community organization can come out and pitch to us on activation for public space or participate in one of our of our design competitions so that you can get involved more directly and if you're not involved then come in and attend the events not just the disco <laughs> not just the disco <laughs> all of the events yeah. great i think we're all knowing your work i think we're all really grateful to have you at the city and and really you and your team focusing and putting such a great effort on public space because I do personally do think it's important, and uh, we do see how the city of Vancouver is, or how we use public space in the city of Vancouver, actually changing since I've moved here. I don't know, what, seventeen years ago, eighteen years ago. I agree. I think yeah. it's become a lot more vibrant. We're we're expecting better quality public space as a, as a citizenship. You we know. expect more and we should continue to yeah. demand more yeah. from our public spaces. Wonderful. Well, uh, hopefully we get a lot of people visiting the website and being more engaged in public space because it is for all of us. And I wanted to say thanks again for being here and being my first guest. I'm sure through the podcast series, we'll probably have you back to talk more specifically. I know it's a short time and it's hard to get all the details and nuances of public life and public space into, you know, 20 minutes or so, but thank you for being succinct, (laughs) but it's still uh, really engaging and and being willing to talk to us about public space. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be your first guest. Thanks, Danielle. For more information on this or any other episodes of the Happy Texture podcast, you can find us at happytexture.com. 
H-A-P-P-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E dot com. Special thanks to our sponsors, Cora Architecture and Interiors, designing places for being. Post-production by Vanessa Hennessy.